Right. Uh, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 20th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, uh, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I uh, welcome members and welcome uh, our uh, guests this morning? And can I remind everyone, please, turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electrical devices so they don't interfere with the sound system. Uh, I think we have no apologies this morning, so we have a full house uh, from members. I hope everyone has suitably refreshed after a short recess. Uh, item one uh, on uh, the agenda. Um, can I ask if committee members are content that we take consideration of our work programme at our next meeting in private? Great. Great thank you. Uh, item two, uh, are members content that we take item four on today's agenda, which is just a discussion of the evidence heard in private? Agreed. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, item three. Um, we're having a dis discussion this morning in round table on uh, social enterprises, which I know is something that's been of interest to a number of committee members for some time. And I'm very grateful to uh, our witnesses who joined us today for what I hope will be a, a free-flowing, informative uh, and reasonably informal uh, discussion, although it is on the record and uh, the official report are here taking notes of what is uh, being said. Um, I think just to get things going, it might be useful if we just went around the table and introduced ourselves and said who we are and uh, who we are here at representing. Um, so I just start and I'll pass on to Dennis and go around the table uh, this way. Um, I'm uh, Murdo Fraser. I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for uh, Mid Scotland and Fife, and I am the uh, convener of the uh, committee and in the chair for today's session. I'll hand over to Dennis. Uh, and good morning. I'm Dennis Robertson. I'm the MSP for Aberdeenshire West, and I'm the deputy convener of this committee. Hello, I'm Andrew Nick Seaman. I'm the assistant chief executive of the Calman Trust. We operate a range of social enterprises in Highlands as a vehicle for delivering employment and training to young people. Mike McKenzie, I represent the Highlands and Islands region. I'm Brian Weaver. I'm the Chief Executive of HiSES, which delivers business support to social enterprises in the Highlands and Islands. I'm Jim Brody. I'm uh, one of the MSPs for the south of Scotland region, and I have the privilege of being the convener of the cross-party group on social enterprises. My name is Duncan Osler. I'm a partner with McRoberts Law Firm. I'm here as Chair of Social Enterprise Scotland, which is a member-led organisation promoting an interest in understanding and development of social enterprise. I'm Margaret McDougall, MSP for West Region. I'm Ewan Fraser. I'm the Chief Executive of the Dean Canmore Group, who are an affordable housing group based in Edinburgh, but working across the Edinburgh and Lothians. I'm Richard Baker, and I'm an MSP for the North East Scotland. I'm Alastair Davis, the Chief Executive of Social Investment Scotland, and we make loans and other repayable investments to charities and social enterprises across Scotland. I'm Joan McAlpine, MSP for the South of Scotland. I'm Fiona Pearson, the coordinator of the West Lothian Social Enterprise Network. We're one of the newer networks. Marco Biaggi, I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Central. I'm Karen McGregor, Chief Executive of Firstport. We support new start social enterprises across Scotland. Um, we provide them with business support, start-up funds and practical help. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. <coughs> uh, my name is Neil McLean. I'm the Chief Executive of the Social Enterprise Academy. We run accredited learning for social enterprises and social entrepreneurs across Scotland. Okay, thank you. I'm also joined by Diane and Dougie, who are from our, our clerking team. Um, good. Uh, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, I think the way I would like to run this um, is, is really around three uh, broad topics. I get a discussion around the three. And, and the, the first topic would be on um, what is a Scottish, what is a social enterprise? Do we understand what that is? Do we understand um, uh, what uh, the scope of social enterprises are in Scotland? So, first topic around kind of definitions um, uh, and, and the scale of the sector. Um, the, the second topic I'd like to introduce is what are the um, what is the value of uh, a social enterprise? What are the benefits to society of a social enterprise? What are the advantages? What are the social and economic uh, opportunities that arise? And the third topic, which I suspect might be the meatiest of the three, uh, is what are we currently doing to support Scottish enterprises and what more should we be doing in terms of Scottish government policy and other, other agencies? And then we can perhaps touch on things like 
uh, funding, uh, public uh, procurement and uh, business support and so on. And, and the way I'd like to run this is, I mean, I, I, obviously we need to, to chair it, so if you, can, you know, if you want to contribute, just catch my eye and I'll bring you in. And, you know, the, the, the MSPs here, feel free to chip in, uh, ask questions, make contributions, but we really want to hear from the witnesses. So if we can maybe start off on the first topic, which is what is a social enterprise? Um, maybe I could start, Duncan, with you, um, given your role. And can you tell us what you think a social enterprise is? Yes. A social enterprise is a business that trades like another business, but has a purpose, which is a social one, more than simply the making of that money. And uh, if you are a charity, you have a, a beneficial charitable aim. If you're a community interest company, you'll have a community interest. More fundamentally than that, the question is, if a surplus is generated by the social enterprise, by the business, where does that profit go? So the generation of, of, of profit, but along the way, when you engage in the activities that you do to achieve that surplus, that income and that enterprise, what impacts are achieved along the way, such as in relation to employment, employability, uh, in, in environmental and other gains? So, okay. uh, if I could answer it a different way, yep. there is no standard definition uh, that is an absolute, unchanging, unfixed mm -hmm. one because of the nature of human endeavour. Yes. Well, that, that's actually the, the point I was going to follow up and ask you is, is to what extent is the definition you very helpfully outlined agreed by everybody or are there different interpretations? It's a, it's a fluid and ongoing discussion. I mean, I think others should comment on that as well. But I, I, think, I think that... We'll, that I'm a lawyer, and therefore a definition is a good thing, but I also know that definitions are something that you don't always agree on. It's, it's important to be discussing it so you get to the essence of, of purpose, and it's business with purpose is another way to look at it. Anybody else want to chip in on this point, uh, the question of definitions? Yes, please. One thing that frustrates uh, West Lothian Social Enterprise Network members is the term not-for-profit, because a social enterprise is not not-for-profit, it's what you do with your profit. That's important. Okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting to note that in Scotland, our definitions of social enterprise are perhaps more rigid, particularly when compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, but also when contrasted to the rest of Europe and also uh, to organisations in the States where there might be a more liberal interpretation of where uh, the profits from a social enterprise can go, um, as long as it was making a social purpose, whereas in, in Scotland in particular, we are... Uh, quite keen on the idea of having things uh, locked in in terms of uh, where that profit can be distributed. So there is a, there is a difference between uh, Scotland and other countries. But when you say there's a difference between Scotland and other countries, who, who, who in Scotland is, is enforcing that um, definition? I think the, the, the social enterprise movement, to a certain extent, polices uh, the definition. But I think that as it, the, the movement grows in prominence um, and understanding, then that will be open to, to more challenge and discussion from um, other organisations and other people. Right. Um, I would like to uh, add to that that I think we've had years to actually define social enterprise properly, and it hasn't happened, I don't think. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I used to be a biochemist, and we liked hard definitions. Um, and the, my fear now is that the UK government has just decided that tax relief will be given by individuals to inv invest in social enterprises, and that says to me that the people who are going to make a definition of social enterprise will be HMRC, because they will, the, the tax authorities will decide what is, a, um, what is a social enterprise and what's not. And we've kind of missed a trick there. So I would really like us to sit down and have a very specific definition of social enterprise. Okay. Thank you. Um, Karen? I think it's worth mentioning that uh, one of the membership organisations, Sane Scott, has a, a code of practice, and that's, I think, fair to say, is, is generally widely accepted, you know, amongst social, uh, you know, social enterprises in Scotland, and probably is what most of us work to, um, in terms of, you know, getting closer to an accepted definition. But I, I think Brian makes a fair point about who may <laughs> end up giving us a tighter definition. Um, you. I think coming from a housing association point of view, we have rules or registered friendly societies and the, and the rules and charitable rules that we have. Uh, we are in business, but we're in business to the benefit of the community. And it's just really the community benefit. And I would go back to the kind of profit for a purpose. Every business has to make a surplus of some sort. 
but it's, the, it's what you do and it's a profit for a purpose. It's really the key thing for housing associations. So we have to really deliver a service. We've got to deliver a service in the community, but to give the affordable housing service, the affordability bit is really important, that you've got to re retain the affordability. So to do that, you must use your money wisely and, and, and create the benefit for the community. And I think as housing associations have been around a long time, but it's only recently they've been really recognising themselves as social enterprises, using their kind of enterprising nature, really to give that benefit back to the community. Um, I think, Mark, were you were trying to come in? Yes, uh, to come back to one of the points that had been made about the definitions being broader elsewhere, um, Alistair, where else would those returns go? Uh, and where do they go in those other areas you were, you were referring to? I'd be keen to have it explained a bit more. Uh, so in the main, a proportion of those profits may be distributed to either the owners or the shareholders in that particular uh, social enterprises. So in, for example, uh, Germany, the context of uh, who is a social entrepreneur may be somebody who wants to set up in business uh, to have a social purpose and still creates that social purpose, but may extract wealth from that enterprise personally, um, which is what we wouldn't necessarily see uh, in Scotland. Now, I'm not uh, for a minute saying that, that I believe that is right in every case, but I think it's worth being aware that there are um, a range of definitions in Scotland, but also a range of definitions uh, in a, probably in a worldwide context. OK, uh, I think, Neil, you were next. Adding more confusion. <laughs> Many social enterprises also have charitable status, so you have that kind of confusion as well. So the, the extracting profit is in a particular model, a community interest company. Charities obviously have to be governed by those rules as well. So uh, to my view, the, in the broader third sector, there are charities who are social enterprises that don't use the term, and there are organisations who are social enterprises or use the term and probably are not operating as social enterprises, but are jumping on that bandwagon. So it's, it's a confused scene generally. Um, and if, for me, it's that code of practice that Karen referred to, which we're subscribing to, but also that sense of an exchange of value taking place. So there's a business context, exchange of value taking place, and the profits being broadly retained for the purpose of the organisation. Mike, you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, this is obviously an interesting discussion, but I think it, it would be kind of more interesting, or certainly I would be interested to hear, and I think Brian maybe touched on this, is that um, does it matter that we don't have a precise, all-embracing, universally accepted definition? Or, Brian may have been hinting at it, um, does this give rise to problems? And, um, you know, certain things occur to me that I'm aware of some uh, social enterprises, for instance, who are undertaking projects that they're raising finance for it through a crown fund funding mechanism whereby they distribute profits to those that buy shares in the, in the project. And, you know, given HMRC, given Oscar's role and so on, um, you know, is this lack of a definition and understanding likely to cause problems or is it already causing problems? I'd be really keen to hear about that. If Brian, so your point is, if, 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 if we are talking about you know, a specific tax benefit, then clearly there will need to be an agreed definition, won't there? Yeah. And I think even if you look at that piece of research um, that was done just recently for the big lottery, they actually say in that, I think they, they inquired about 3,500 uh, 3, organisations. They got 192 responses from them. And yet, when you read three or four pages further on, of those 192, 42% of the respondents didn't actually fulfil um, the definition of being a social enterprise themselves. Now, if we are getting organisations responding who don't know or don't think that they're social enterprises themselves, if they are confused, God help everybody else. You know, and we are seeing, we've seen probably 500 social enterprises, small ones throughout the Highlands and Islands over the last six years. Um, and we're always trying to work out, would you actually be a social enterprise or are you just a straightforward charity? Do you trade or do you trade sufficiently that actually you should just be a, a charity and just leave it at that? Um, we put all sorts of demands on people simply because we've brought in the whole concept of social enterprise. And if we, if we defined it and said, actually, if you're a social enterprise, you're going to be aspiring to something. You're going to be aspiring to a big business. Therefore, why aren't you VAT registered? 
and nobody's ever suggested that. Mm. But I think VAT registration would really focus the minds. You don't need to be a big organisation to be VAT registered, but you need to be concentrated. Those are the kind of things I think about keep me awake at night. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, Andrew. I think there's another um, uh, point, which is that there's, there's almost two different types of social enterprise, and I think that it, 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 some of it covers charitable status, but it's whether your social mission is part of your activity or is it that your activity generates a surplus which is then used for the social mission or a combination of both? And I think that adds another layer of, of confusion as well. Uh, I think Richard, can I make a point? Briefly, it's not following from what um, Brian Weaver was saying. I mean, you mentioned the fact that some organisations, which may be social enterprises, aren't defining themselves as such. I wondered also to what extent of the fact uh, with more and more local services being contracted out of organisations doing uh, that work and it might well be a care service but they're actually in it for, for profit rather than for investing uh, the, any profits they're making in, in social uh, causes or, or, or in the enterprise they're carrying out and to what extent there's therefore a number of organisations who are actively looking to push the boundaries themselves to try and define themselves as a social enterprise when that actually is not what they're doing, and of course there may soon be a tax incentive to do that as well, so it seems to me it's quite a challenging picture at the moment. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I suspect I have a view on what the answer to this question is, but it would be interesting to hear the views around the table. As we've heard about what may or may not be a, uh, a social enterprise, who qualifies a social enterprise as being a social enterprise, in your opinion? Social Enterprise Scotland has members who are social enterprises, and as a, a, when someone applies to be a member, we would, we would assess whether or not they, they are social enterprises, which is easier to do in the context of a registered charity because their purpose is obviously aligned with a social mission. And in, in cases where it's unclear as to their purpose, uh, we would not be comfortable qualifying them as a social enterprise. That is a qualification for the purpose of membership of our organisation. It has no other significance in a sense. But, um, but can I just, 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 Duncan, I, that's, that's, that's good, but asking the other organisations, are the standards all the same in terms of the interpretations or the definitions all the same as to you are a social enterprise because you fulfil this set of criteria? This is something that frustrates West Lothian and our members greatly, that if I had a pound for every hour I've spent trying to define social enterprise instead of actually getting on with my work, <laughs> I, I, I would be making a profit myself. Um, <laughs> however, I think that West Lothian, we, we're a fairly new network and we've got a lot of traditional voluntary sector charities who are trying to become more enterprising but that does not mean to say they'll ever be a social enterprise business. Um, I think it's a really interesting time for social enterprise development. We seem to have a cultural change happening where we have businesses that are set up with the purpose of making surplus profit uh, with which to do good things and to support social good on the way, on the way along. Um, and then we have the traditional voluntary sector charities whose grant funding is being squeezed to the point where they're now looking inwards and saying, can we actually sell what we do? And you can only make a business out of something that people want to buy. So a befriending charity is never going to make a profit because nobody wants, nobody can pay for it. The, the, the people who buy the end product don't have the money. So there's, there's definitely two sides to that development. It's quite an interesting one. I used to manage a social enterprise in West Lothian that was set up as a cleaning business. It's very successful. It donates its surplus profits back to a housing association that's a subsidiary of a housing association. It runs as a business with its own management committee. It is VAT registered, um, and it has to pay corporation tax occasionally if they don't pay everything back to the charity. But, you know, they've given away £28,000 over the last five years to support the local community, but they're a business first. They employ people in an area of multiple deprivation, they recycle 75% of all the waste that they handle, so there's an environmental impact, and then they support organisations with the, the profit, surplus profit. But that's uh, fairly straightforward. 
if you've got a charity, and we have another one in West London, it's a good example, called Homemade, and they're a furniture recycling charity. They used to give furniture free of charge to people who were coming out of homelessness. They now have to sell their furniture in a shop at prices that are above what homeless people can afford in order to generate profit to try and supply some free stuff. So they're struggling badly with that shift. Um, definitions, I, I, I think it is useful. We use the Sensco uh, voluntary code and we would always look at, is there an asset lock? For us, that's, that's the thing. What happens to the profits? Is, is it locked? Are the assets of the company locked? So that if that company winds up, what happens to all the assets? It's as good as we've got at the moment. But I really wish we had a clear definition and we could stop talking about it and just do it. <laughs> okay, well, I sense we're getting towards the end of this particular point, but if you others want to come in, I'll, Dennis was, was next. Yeah. Uh, I think, to, to some extent, um, uh, if we have Social Enterprise Scotland saying they've got a criteria in terms of membership, it, is it not then logical to say that if there is a criteria to set out what is a social enterprise in terms of membership, then they take that criteria and and say define you know the, the definition from that criteria i mean is that just too simple okay um, perhaps not yeah. right i think it may be too simple because there are different views of what is a genuine social enterprise but you have a criteria that you set you mark it against a criteria do you not in terms of membership we we are we're simply a private organization member led and we over time developed um a uh, uh, criterion which are which are core um, purpose and, and, and where the profits go and indeed also the asset lock um, specifically looking at a charity or a kick that is th therefore a clear and relatively straightforward test to meet the, the issue with which why it's slightly over simple is that there are other ways in which an organization could set itself up legally in order to achieve social mission uh, and as time evolves, uh, I, would, I would wish that th there's a, a, a greater development and enhancement of the sector. Not, not that we, we stick things uh, as at today's date and, and not evolve. And Alice has mentioned um, developments overseas. That there's, there's a fundamental need for great impact to be um, delivered. Um, and, and anything which tends to restrict that, impair that, I, I, would, I, would, I would urge you to think about. Uh, by, by impact, I mean social investment, because the UK has introduced a social investment tax relief. It's not a social enterprise tax relief, it's a social investment tax relief. That's an important distinction. I think it's because HMRC recognise that a definition of social enterprise per se is not as helpful as a definition of investment. If it's about tax, it's about money and finance and, and, and relief in relation to that financial component of a business. But I'd also say it is not simply a matter of social finance, of, of economic and financial activity. These businesses have a social purpose. That is their essence in some way or other. Okay. Um, you and your want to come in? I did. I, I, I think the, to put social enterprise in a box is so firmly defined. I, it, it might curb entrepreneurship. I mean, it might stop things happening. I think diversity is a strength. I think there has to be a broad guideline on what social enterprise should be. And this is about, you know, some, something like profit for a purpose. I mean, it really has to go on a sort of social means. But to have it so finely defined, you're going to maybe curb opportunity. Uh, we, we are a social enterprise in the sense that we've got two companies. One's a charity, one's trading. One trades to support the charity. We don't. We don't want to be living off kind of grant funding all the time. We really, because there's it is, public money is going away very quickly. It's very difficult to get it. But we've still got tenants. We've got huge needs. We've got people in communities with huge needs. So how do we support that? We look at kind of how can we have businesses around that company that are going to give a benefit to communities and business. The profit from the business then gets churned back into supporting people in a whole range of different ways about you know, supporting homelessness, as Fiona has already been saying. So I think the diversity should be seen as a strength, and let's not put social enterprise into a box, which is so firmly defined that it just uh, it, it curbs opportunity. So you don't want a definition? I want a broad definition, but not <laughs> right. too tight. Not <laughs> I want a bit of flexibility here. Okay, uh, Neil. Briefly, I think historically the debate between what's a social enterprise and what isn't in relation to the third sector has been done to death and is um, largely agreed. The bit that's still to be agreed and I think is really interesting is what's going to happen between the social enterprise and the private sector. 
which isn't existing in a vacuum and will respond, and as uh, Duncan's saying, you know, that idea of social investment, where does social change come from, becomes much more interesting rather than the definition of the organisational structure that happens in the middle. And I would agree with you in, in terms of keeping a broad definition as possible so that we're not boxing ourselves into a corner. Alison, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering what the, the links are. I'll probably um, direct this to Duncan in the first instance. You know, the links between traditional business models and social enterprise business models. I mean, these days, lots of multinationals are falling over themselves to, to prove and emphasise their corporate social responsibility. Um, have you ever had anyone come to you that, you know, I suppose, I, I don't want to name any particular companies here, but there are companies out on the high street who are determined that they're playing a really important role in their communities. Do you ever have anybody, you know, coming to you saying, actually, we'd like to get more involved? And are you learning from one another? Could that be useful? We have a category of associate members, which are entities that don't meet all of the, the test of being a social enterprise, but are nevertheless interested in, um, in social enterprise and, and working with and collaborating with social enterprises. Um, and I would also distinguish a, a private business, which has got a corporate social responsibility um, element from a social enterprise. It's a fundamental difference between a business that trades to make money privately, the owners take that money in, as profit. And they may use CSR in order to further that profit-making endeavour. And, and a social enterprise, which actually has as its purpose that, um, that social uh, aim. There's a lot of talk about investment and uh, where that's going. I think the, there is a risk that by focusing too much on definitions, we run the risk of forgetting the fact that we're actually all about creating social impact in whatever sense that may be. And it is a real sign of strength, I think, that the social enterprise community is now attracting the attention of business and investment and the, the wider economy because it's been seen as something that is... Um, attractive and sustainable and viable. Um, and that therefore means that the private sector are interested and uh, there are new streams of social investment opening up that are interested. And there is a risk that um, you may miss out on the opportunities that that investment may bring by too tightly defining uh, the types of activities that that can be invested in uh, to the detriment of um, the people of Scotland in, in some senses, which may in fact be benefited by um, a slight opening up um, of interpretation of what uh, can and can't be um, a social enterprise, and I think it's, it's good that we're starting to, to have that discussion, but it, I don't think we should compromise ourselves uh, just for the sense of following the money that's out there. I think, I mean, uh, also that, that neatly kind of takes us on to the second part of the discussion, because I think, you know, I think we've, we've, we've more or less exhausted the definition point, and I think we might, I'll bring you in a second, but, but I think, you know, we've come to the view that um, we're not going to agree this morning on the definition, and there are, there are, there are different views. Mike, are you desperate to make a point on definitions? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just wanted to say that in my experience, having dealt with a number of constituent problems, um, I think it really is quite important that we get perhaps not a single definition, but a set of working legal guidelines um, to give people some comfort and certainty. Um, we always get called in as MSPs when there are problems. Um, and perhaps we see, you know, our views may be a bit jaundiced by that, but the lack of a definition that's clearly understood um, in what are often very complex areas, I think can cause great harm and great difficulty. Representing a primarily rural area, I think in rural areas sometimes these problems come to the fore more often than they do in, in, in uh, urban and city areas. But, you know, just to give you a, a brief example, um, the Viking wind farm in Shetland, um, a collaboration between the community or a community interest company, if you like, or, you know, something that would be broadly defined as a social enterprise and SSE, um, whose board members comprise a number of local councillors. And the amount of difficulty that, you know, that the, the, the kind of loosely defined good purpose has caused for individuals and in legal terms and so on is just staggering. Um, and as we get further into this territory with more social enterprises, hybrids, um, you know, I can foresee even more problems. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big recurring themes is HMRC and VAT people 
struggling themselves to keep up with um, this territory and all kinds of um, judgments been made that appear to be in some instances fairly perverse and individuals who largely as volunteers getting involved in social enterprises wishing to do good for their communities ending up saying I don't want to have anything to do with this stuff you know I've been threatened with prosecution fines convictions all kinds of stuff it's too complex nobody seems to be able to give me clear guidance or you know and you know so I see it as a territory that's fraught with difficulty and the purpose of getting a good working definition or set of definitions is to give guidance to all all who uh, interact with social enterprises from your local VAT inspector to the you know the local volunteer that wants to do some good for their community okay well look I think if we can if we move on to kind of the second part of the discussion which was really about the value of social enterprises what what are the benefits from uh, having a vibrant social enterprise sector and specifically looking at a situation Richard was kind of touching on earlier where you're seeing perhaps more um, traditional public services being being delivered through a social enterprise model than perhaps was previously the case what are the what are the advantages what are the potential pitfalls around that and they have a, a view on that that issue putting traditional public services out, uh, social enterprises can be very well placed, especially if they work in partnership. It's very rare, certainly in a small area like West Lothian, that any of our social enterprises could get the whole pie, but working together they could all have a piece. The issue that we have, and this is another discussion that we've been seem to have been talking about for years, is uh, community value and, and how you value that in the procurement system. West Lothian Council are fairly forward thinking and they have now gone through every contract they've got to see if they can put a community benefit clause in or a social benefit clause. Unfortunately, it is not weighted in the decision making process. So they're, they're actually still, we're working on that to take that forward. But if you're, going to ha if you're going to say that social outcomes have a value, you need to have a mechanism for valuing it. And that is another uh, box of frogs quite honestly. Um, in West Lothian, uh, West Lothian Council, with the help of money from the Scottish Government, are actually doing a research project with Strathclyde University to see if there can be one tool that can be used across community asset transfer, procurement and measuring social outcomes and funding. And you have to have a value to that. Richard? Well, certainly, it's clear from other um, countries, other parts of the UK, that you can give a higher weighting than is often the case, uh, currently given to community benefit uh, clauses, for example. But sh hasn't some of these uh, issues been addressed through the Procurement Bill uh, uh, Act now, uh, Fiona, or is that, or some of that work still to be done? It's, it's ongoing. It's, oh, no. it's sort of been kick-started all by, uh, by the, the, the procurement reforms. Um, I think it's only a good thing, but we have to get it right. We can't spend another five years messing about with are we going to use social return on investment? Are we going to use social auditing? Um, it might well be that each authority will come to its own mechanism, but we're saying don't make this too complicated um, because it just it, there's an awful lot of the smaller social enterprises just look at it and say yeah, that's just beyond our, our resources to do an SROI um, calculation. I actually did one and it was it was horrible and and uh, somebody else did it and came out with a different figure so it could, we could actually make it say what we wanted um so i think that that's a useful kick start there and, and we're, we're on the right lines and certainly it can be fairly frustrating to do research and do the background work but we think it's really important and so then when the council's going forward putting the clauses in is to get one mechanism that can be used across the disciplines it might well be that that wouldn't work for other authorities, but it seems to be the way we're going in West Lothian. Um, check. <coughs> Just a, alluding to the fact of the Procurement Act, uh, and perhaps you know, get some comment in terms of a local authorities' views of social enterprise and how they engage. I mean, I, I'm trying to get social enterprise set up in, in, in air with uh, rickshaws, with youngsters going around on these 
encouraging uh, people not to drop litter. Now, how do you manage, how do you measure that, other than you know the place looks better, etc. Um, I'm not persuaded that the local authority necessarily will jump up and down saying great. Um, so it would be interesting to see the opportunities for the outsourcing um, in, in areas that will see a social benefit as to whether or not um, local authorities will embrace the knowledge that they will provide the core elements that they're there to provide and be prepared to outsource particularly to social enterprises, you know, exclusively, but uh, those things like litter or what have you that uh, clearly demonstrate uh, a social value and a social benefit. Do we have a sense of the total value of social enterprise to the Scottish economy? Has anybody, has anybody done that calculation? Mark Lee. Yeah, I'm not speaking on behalf of the the enterprises, but I would have thought that because so much of it is a social impact, it would be almost impossible to quantify. Is that a fair analysis? I mean, I, I have seen economists try to analyse the value of, of clean water and streams and so on. There's nothing beyond economists' attempts to, to quantify, but it would strike me that that would be something that would be difficult and therefore actually be a challenge for the, the sector in justifying its value. Um. Um, first of all, uh, we evaluated uh, our services over the last five years, and I'm talking about young, fledgling businesses, given that we work with individuals from a standing start. And we found that oh, the, the social enterprises that were, were up and running had stayed up and running and had been going, say, for just under um, three years. Um, on average, they were creating 2.4 local jobs in their area and about 140 people you know, were benefiting on average from each enterprise. So we were trying to find some harder statistics, I think. Um, you know, you're right in terms of, um, you know, from our point of view, because we're not necessarily delivering the social impact, it's quite hard for us to go out and, and measure that. But I think it's, it's important to realise that not all social enterprises are set up to deliver public services. A lot of them are set up in the you know, trade like ordinary businesses, they deal direct with the consumer. And if I may just tell you about a particular initiative that First Port's been running in Glasgow, which was, is part of the Commonwealth Games legacy. And we started a project called Beyond the Finish Line. Um, we set ourselves a target of working with um, 10 uh, young social entrepreneurs at a very, very early stage and gave them the deadline of the games to get up and running. We ended up working with 15 of them because the quality and the variety of ideas were so good. And I'm pleased to say that by the time the games kicked off, that about 10 of those actually were trading. But at a local level, what we're finding in, um, you know, in terms of these young businesses, and a lot of them were from the creative industries, so it was craft-based products, it was environmental, upcycling businesses. The, the biggest issue that they now face is finding the right kind of affordable short-term lease. And at a local level, there's a real issue around landlords and how they're approaching you know, that issue. And that won't just be for social enterprises. I think that's for small businesses you know, across the board. And I think a really, a really positive outcome um, you know, of this work, not just in Glasgow but across Scotland, would be for local landlords, whether it be the local authority and the properties they own or some of the absent landlords, to start really looking at that issue because um, we'll all benefit from it because what we were demonstrating was that social enterprise, for example, can tackle that problem of empty shops, vacant spaces in the high street. Nobody wants to be walking down and, and seeing this, but Retail is not the only answer, um, and it, you know it's, it's not providing us with the, the whole solution. And a social enterprise can go in, and it can deliver a completely different experience because our high streets are about, you know, a place to learn, a place, a place to be creative, you know, a, a place to meet, a place to be active. It's all of these things, and I think that's where the, you know, going back to the original question about the value that social em uh, enterprise can play, and that regeneration agenda. It's, it's not just about economic regen uh, regeneration. You know, it can it can help really make a, an, an impact in that. But only if we all work together, and that has to be the local authorities along with social enterprises. Yeah. In terms of scale, the, the published numbers suggest that the size of the social economy, in its broadest sense, is about three and a half percent of the Scottish GDP, and about four percent of employees 
in Scotland are employed in some form of third sector organisation. The ECOS study that was done by the big lottery suggested the majority of that was in a social enterprise category. Um, but again, you're back to definitions. That's the kind of scale of it. Okay. Um, Andrew. I think just to sort of pick up on what Karen was, was, was saying, um, we need to be clever about what it is that we try to measure. Um, I mean, if I can touch on my organisation purely in terms of numbers, we support about 400 young people a year, train about 150 and employ 40. But actually, the reason that we do business is because we believe that the trading is better, not necessarily to increase the numbers. <coughs> We think that you can train more people with employability skills if you are training them in a real business, and therefore they become better employees when they move on. So our interest would be in measuring that, the sustainability of the outcome, rather than particularly the numbers of young people involved or the income generated. But all three are important. Yes. Yeah. Just follow up on that point. Um, do you think the social enterprise actually provides then opportunities for individuals or groups of individuals that maybe aren't getting into the employment market through the sort of normal standard means of you know getting out there and just finding a job do you think in terms of the training opportunities uh, for certain individuals that may be finding it hard to get into the employment market is that the social benefit of some of the social enterprises that's that's the the essence of the organization that, that i'm involved in yes so we can we can employ people who are when they join us, not employable, because they have potentially other challenges going on in their lives. So young people who may be late to work every day, we can put support to work with them because it may actually be that they're carrying out an inappropriate caring role at home. Mm -hmm. So we can work with them to solve that problem while offering them training and employment, and not many employers, I think, would be able to, to take that amount of time. I think you and you and your in your submission um, sort of looked at this as being uh, opportunities rather than barriers. Is that right? Yes. One of the kind of initiatives we have is we have a homeless hostel in Leith. Uh, and people are coming to the hostel in a, you know, because they're homeless, because they've got a whole range of different issues or different problems. So what we're trying to do is to try and break that cycle of homelessness. Uh, and, the, and the way to do that is to give, get them a house and get them a job. But the people who are coming to hostels are probably unemployable. Uh, so what, what we've been looking at is assessing them for a matter of 8 to 12 weeks. And then uh, we put them into what we class a training flat. And we teach them social skills, budgeting skills, computer skills, how you write a CV, anything to really get them into employment and make them employable. And then we move them from a, a training flat into a kind of permanent tenancy. And that's, again, creating opportunities for, for people who have really got personal issues. And the people who have gone through that system over the last two or three years have had a 100% success rate in people sustaining their tenancy for more than a year. It's very good, and a lot of them now go to college. They can, they can go into employment, they can, they can hold down a job, so they can hold down a job, they can sustain their tenancy. So I think you've got to look at opportunities. Uh, and we've been looking at other opportunities. How, how, do you, how do you build confidence? And there's just simple things like Street Soccer Scotland, who was a kind of a social enterprise. And we work with them, and we've got a kind of initiative called Football Works. So they play football, and then we give them a bit of training. So they have to, part of the deal is, after they've had their, their game of football, they must have a, our session in the classroom, and we'll give them a bit of uh, skills on, 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 on being, becoming a bit more computer literate, how do you write a CV, what kind of some of the skills are. And it's linking simple things like that. It creates opportunity. And that is getting people back into employment. It's helping the economy. But how do you measure that success in, in, in a number side? And that's really quite difficult. Um, Brian. Your question is about the value of social enterprises. And the, the topics we've heard there just now have been about homelessness and care and employability, which are all the big ones that we see all the time. When you go into a Highland village, you might have a generation where you don't actually have one of those problems, but you have other things that, are, um, that your economy is so small that no national organisation is going to come into. So all over the Highlands, we've got small social enterprises that will do everything from running the ferry in Glen Elg to hundreds of them running their village halls to 
other ones who will start um, organisations which are about bringing new crafts back into or, or retaining old crafts. Um, and do it. So we have this really, really wide range of delivery of a social value which would never be delivered commercially because there's not enough money in it for commercial organisations to be interested in it. So, so social enterprise is much wider than, and sometimes just now I'm hearing it becoming, you know, more centralised. And here is the things that this, that social enterprise can do for government of our, or for delivering, um, you know, a, a government policies and so on. But the reality is, it's about the people. It's about the people that live in communities and the things that those folk want. There's some brilliant art centres. Um, there's some, you know, wonderful organisations all over transport all over the Highlands. Um, if it wasn't for local communities running their transport associations, they just wouldn't have any. So those are the, I'd like you to keep that in mind, you know, when you're outside of Edinburgh, that, that there are loads of social enterprises out there, and they're not just doing the things that, that hit the, the headlines all the time. Well, those groups appear where there isn't a critical mass for a commercial delivery. So how do they make their money? I mean, how do they bridge that? That, that unviability. And that's a really fascinating one because what tends to and what has happened over the last 10 years is that contracts have got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a real problem if you're a small social enterprise and, and it can be do, doing anything. It can be, you know, a social enterprise who's, you know, a village hall who has somebody there um, being the janitor of the village hall. And if that village hall could also cut the grass locally, they could get enough money from cutting the grass to to help running the village hall. And yet the grass cutting contract is likely to be a million pounds and picked up by a multinational because it's a whole national contract. <coughs> now, if, <coughs> if local authorities were, you, you mentioned community benefit clauses, community benefit clauses enable local authorities to see, oh, there's a good organization to give this contract to, but a small contract makes it even easier. We, High says, has a turnover of 225,000 pounds a year. We can't go for a three million pound contract. We need small ones. If we had £30,000 contracts, we could go for them all the time. And that's what I would ask you to do. Think about small well, that's, I mean, Brian, that's a very interesting point, and, and it kind of needs, neatly leads on to kind of the, the third, probably the most important topic I wanted to discuss, which is, you know, in terms of you know, public policy, what, what is the support currently available for social enterprises in terms of government, local authorities, agencies? And what more needs to be done? And you know, we've already touched on one thing about in relation to procurement, where Parliament passed a, a procurement bill uh, just a few months ago, um, which has a, a provision in it for community benefit clauses, which obviously is a step in the right direction, might not go far enough. Um, but I'm interested to hear, you know, what is the experience of um, public support for social enterprises in terms of the framework, in terms of funding, access to funding, all these issues, and what more needs to be done? Duncan. Okay. Um, I think it is a fair assessment to say that, compared to other countries, Scotland has a leading position in relation to social enterprise compared to dozens and dozens of countries I've travelled and, and others here have travelled internationally to visit the World Forum of Social Enterprise. And Scotland is regarded with envy because there has been a long term consistent and coherent programme of support for social enterprise ground up. And the Scottish Government is to be commended for that, and indeed over a number of years a number of organisations have added to that, uh, and I would not say that, uh, and that's, that, that's really social enterprise Scotland's role in terms of promoting policy it is in this sense less important than the work of the, of the programme delivery agencies that have actually implemented these programmes over many years. It relates to training, it relates to uh, enterprise funds and the like. And um, th that is all good. The, um, th there is much more, however, to be done in this context. And I would, uh, just a couple of points on, 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 on value and on measurement. Clearly, we need to measure. And clearly, there needs to be a broad d d base of, of data. But it's impossible to measure <coughs> the gain in confidence of a young person. So there is a limit to that exercise. But if you look at Christie and the requirement for preventative measures, um, as well, the, the people Ewan, Ewan is talking about, who are able to, to, to play a, a greater contribution in society, um, uh, able to be employed, able to contribute, and their families that therefore don't need the, the social support, the, the cost is re reduction. It, it, it's actually, it's not so much a percentage, it's often a factor 
of the benefit financially, if nothing else, in, in, in social enterprise endeavour. And although, as a procurement lawyer, I will tell you that the authority, such as West Lothian, must create a level playing field between all potential bidders for contracts, um, if, and, and if an authority is able to take into account the, the, the impact, then actually it's a pretty tall order to compete with, a, with an effective social enterprise. Furthermore, the, 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 one of the key things about the Procurement Reform Act is not just on the community benefit side, but also the requirement for an authority to think about breaking contracts into lots. Because currently, to, to too great an extent, the language of the procurement rules at European level is money. It's currency, mere money. We're actually, we're all interested in social uh, matters and procurement is about doing things for people and social people to pe people to people. So that, as, as Brian says, breaking things into smaller units is, is very helpful. But at the end of the day, we're talking about social matters. And, and finally, there are so many different types of social enterprises, as Karen was saying. There are many which face the public sector to support and indeed work, work with, with, with local authorities and the like. There are many which seek to trade on a retail basis to compete head on with, with the high street shops. And, and that is to be commended because as Neil is saying, that proportion of the Scottish economy that is social enterprises, is, is, I would say only three to four percent. That's not insignificant, but we wish it to, to be greater. Um, Richard. Well, Duncan says about the, the position of the, the sector in Scotland being you know, a positive one compared to other countries. But you know, what I hear, what many of my colleagues will hear, is life getting increasingly tough for social enterprise in terms of support, in terms of retendering exercises, in terms of less money for the contracts they're carrying out. A long time ago now, we had, cost, we had debates around a strategic funding review and full cost recovery. Those seem like a, a, a ancient history now. So I, mean, I wonder what more can be done to alleviate that situation and one question I have is for example on three-year funding cycles which is again a question I'm asked very frequently and for a long time we talked about progress or more financial security for social enterprises going forward in terms of their grants and so I'd be interested to hear any comments people have on on those kind of areas and on that, on that question specifically as well as I, have, as I have said, uh, there have been a long-term coherent programme to support social enterprise, which is a good thing. But you're right that the focus has to be on the future and where we go forward. The reality of uh, increased demographic pressures and, an, and, an, and, and a widening gap between the, the affordability of current level of health and social care, for example, means that we have very pressing need. Uh, and I would suggest that social enterprise is a very serious contender for one of the solutions to making that as small a gap as possible. And all those around the table have better explanations of why that is so. Um, but we, we, need, we need to work very hard and there is absolutely not one whit of complacency about what needs to be done and we're not resting on any laurels, we don't have any. Um, Karen. It's a, a more broader point, I suppose, from our perspective because what we're interested in doing is, is building a, a healthy and robust um, pipeline of new starts that will come through and I think, you know, from where I'm sitting, I think in terms of what's needed in, in Scotland is, is, is looking at that pipeline and looking at who's starting up. So I would like to see us being, you know, bringing more people in um, who are much more, you know, ambitious, more confident. Um, but I think that can be said um, whether you're starting up a private business or a social enterprise. Um, I think we need to be sharing more success stories, but not everyone will relate to the Tom Hunters or the Richard Bransons of this world. We need to be showing people that actually it's just people, you know, like them that can go on and be successful and start up, you know, some really good um, businesses. So for me, um, you know, th there, is, there is funding out there, whether it's the new social investment funds coming um, along, whether it's existing grant funds or whether it's finding your right market in, in terms of trading. I think that exists. I think it's about who's coming forward and where this, you know, where the pipeline is coming from. Yes, I, I, just on the last point that Karen makes, I mean, I think it's a, a social enterprise in Scotland. There's, there's no question it's been a, a remarkable uh, success. The danger in that, of course, is why I asked the question about who decides who the new entrants are and how they're qualified. But that's compounded by the fact that many of them require business support. And where do we qualify those that are supposed to give bona fide uh, business support to the various social enterprises, particularly the new entrants. And we also heard in the access to finance uh, session that we had convener that, uh, including small businesses, there are three, 330 
different funding streams. <coughs> now, and to probably get Alice's view on this, I mean, we have to keep this free entrepreneurial spirit going, but there has to be some form of discipline in terms of reducing or, or qualifying properly the business support and also looking at the funding streams because I would suggest uh, that without some form of discipline, whether it's defining three or four different types of social enterprise, without qualifying the business support community that is meaningfully and similarly guided as the social enterprises are towards a social end, uh, and then looking at the funding sources, we have this maze of contacts between social enterprises, business support, funding resources, uh, and that must be swallowing up cost that, and, and expense and money that uh, could be utilised uh, elsewhere. So I think I'd you know, like to understand the, you know, the views of the experts in the field as to how this, this thing hangs together uh, or should hang better. <coughs> I was about to say better together, but I wouldn't say that. <laughs> You tried your best. Politics, politics is definitely off the table today. Um, Alistair, maybe, and then I'll, I'll bring in Neil, but Alistair first. Yep, I think that that is a, a very good point because as the social enterprise market has developed, the social investment marketplace has matured or is maturing alongside that. And there is a greater availability of uh, investment options and, and funding options and grant options available to social enterprises now than perhaps there have been in the past, and that's not just coming from Scottish Government sources, which have been an excellent supporter in terms of that continuum of funding and support over the past five years or so, but there is a requirement on organisations like Social Investment Scotland and others that operate in that field to make it as straightforward as possible for organisations to access that finance. We have to understand that for a social enterprise taking on investment for the first time, that it can be terribly bamboozling for them because there's a jargon and there's a language and there's, there's techniques and tools and products that they might not necessarily be aware of coming from a background where you've just been aware of uh, applying for a grant and spending that and moving on from there. So there's a big job uh, for organisations like us to do to work with other providers and to, to actually develop the investment readiness um, of the social enterprise sector and that's something that, that Social Investment Scotland is doing quite actively with uh, support from the European Union. But just, uh, just to go back about, you were asking about Scottish Government support for um, the social enterprise community. Social Investment Scotland has managed something called the Scottish Investment Fund uh, for the past five years, which was around about a third in terms of value, in terms of the enterprising third sector action plan uh, that came out in about 2008-9. Um, and recently we've just evaluated uh, that programme and we've been quite amazed by the results that have come out in terms of the fact that 100% um, of the organisations that received an investment, that's about 67 organisations, say that they're more effective. Uh, on the whole, they are a lot more optimistic about the future, so that there's more optimism than perhaps uh, the evidence is there. 96% increased uh, their proportion of the income that they earn from trading, and 95% say that they've increased their capacity. So there are a, a movement of organisations who have taken that risk um, in terms of moving forward and taking more control of their own destiny that are now proving that um, that has made them more sustainable, more optimistic of the future, and are able to deliver uh, more social impact. Now, that's a particular type of social enterprise in Scotland. There are, there, there are more than that. But I think that by telling the story of that and by using examples of that, then we can help other organisations move along that journey and, and, to t and provide the support and advice uh, that you were mentioning earlier, Chuck. Can I just ask something on that? Yeah, sure. Type, can you just be clear like, what kind of sectors these groups would be working in, what kind of services they would be providing? It's a... Uh, Pan sector, there was no, no particular theme, but obviously a proportion of the money that came from the Scottish Investment Fund was repayable, so they had to be already um, uh, providing income streams that could be used to repay an investment. So that, that in some ways, provides a distinction to the broader uh, social enterprise community. But the, the whole mission of the Scottish Government support has been to make social enterprises more enterprising through providing enterprise-ready funding and business support. Uh, to support organisations that are moving along that journey to raising more income from their own resources. Um, can, yeah. I, can I just Sorry. add with that? Yes. The other benefit is that it enables organisations to then get a match. So we, we had money from the Social Investment Fund, which we could then use 
to match with grant funding, which we otherwise couldn't have accessed. So the impact was was doubled. Right. Um, Neil. <clears throat> um, just on that point, I think one of the reasons when we go abroad, talking about social enterprise, that people are actually quite um, jealous, quite frankly, of the situation in Scotland is that it's been joined up and strategic for a long time. So you have business support being funded, you have investment, as Alistair's describing so well, supported, and learning and development. So we've got kind of three legs to the stool there on a joined up basis across Scotland. The, the other point I'd like to make is in terms of the earlier question about where do we get the social entrepreneurs coming from, the curriculum for excellence, and again, another part of the Scottish Government's um, strategy was to support entrepreneurship education in the school context through social enterprise. We've now worked in 600 schools across Scotland, 1,000 teachers, 24,000 uh, young people. And what we've found from the teachers, generally speaking, is that if you put the word social in front of the word enterprise, the school is more receptive to the principle of entrepreneurship as a subject. So we're seeing youngsters who are accepting that principle of entrepreneurship because they're being involved in a learning by doing approach to social entrepreneurship. And they know by the fact they've done it that they can at some point in the future start a business. And I think that whole pipeline, that kind of joined up approach the Scottish Government have done so well on over that period, I think is to be commended and is going to bear fruit in the future. Well, not necessarily a social enterprise because yeah. their entrepreneurship basically is taking them forward and you're saying they've got the confidence to move forward. Absolutely. We're not precious about what other business model they want to adopt. We're saying that the entrepreneurship skills are completely transferable yeah. and they're the same and what they want to do in the future is their business. But it, entrepreneurship education, the, the research shows, is too late at university and later. Entrepreneurship in primary schools and secondary schools allows these young people to say, yes, I can at some point in the future. And we're seeing the results of that. It's early days, but it's very positive. Uh, Alison. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of positive input about support, financial and otherwise, for social enterprises and the big lottery fund their research suggests that 64 percent of social enterprises think the future is rosy and they're expecting um, to, to increase turnover in the next three years is that your expectation too and i'd just like to better understand the survival rates among social enterprises do they you know how do they compare with private business survival rates oh. yeah I, I think just picking up on that that point there so we, uh, at First Port, we manage the, um, and have done since 2009, the Scottish Government's Social Entrepreneurs Fund. And um, we, I know you'll all have read this because we did post a copy to um, all the MSPs. Um, but in the Start Something Good um, Impact Report, um, what we found was that of the social enterprises that continued in their, their journey, so that generally meant they'd access the, uh, the, what we call the Level 2 Builder Awards, um, three out of five of them are still around after five years, which we, you know, were ext extremely um, well surprised first of all, um, but very positive about. I, I don't have a comparison though with, um, say, business gateway figures or, or the private sector, but I think if, you know I've brought some extra copies along here today. But if you read the report. Most of the data does actually come from the social entrepreneurs, uh, you know, that set up social enterprises through that support from um, Scottish Government, and it does um, tell us that supporting startups really does work. So that was a big change in 2009 when, you know, Scottish Government looked at putting startups um, into, you know, part of its wider um, third sector um, action plan. One of the things though that we did do, and I think coming back to the point um, that um, Chick had made earlier, which was about it being a maze. What we did was we joined up with um, another fund called the Millennium Awards Trust. So what we, we run a joint programme, which is the Government Social Entrepreneurs <coughs> Fund and the Millennium Awards Trust. So we take in all the complexity, but for the individual start now, there's just one point of access. And then my final point on that is that when you have to combine the money with support. I think if you give money in isolation with no support, it's not going to deliver, you know, the, the outcome or the best outcomes and vice versa. You know, you can have support, but you know, especially startups, each business, you know, it will require some kind of seed funding um, to get going. How do you establish and qualify the business support, the good business support that's needed for a you know, social enterprises. But my experience in in the industry going back is, you know, there's some very good uh, business support. I won't use the word consultant. Business support people, 
but there are also some people who, you know, frankly, are on the make. That's a fair point. Um, I think we've always taken the approach in first port when we employ um, business support advisors, which we keep separate from the people who make the judgments on, say, the funding applications. Um, they've come from a, a commercial background. So, you know, the people that we've employed know about business, you know, can sit down with someone and help them analyse their market and their customers. So I think we we've, we've ourselves have built that in, um, you know, to our own recruitment um, processes and just in terms of how we run the organisation. But again, that is, I guess, um, you know, um, very subjective. I think, you're, you know, you're right. There's lot, you know, there can be lots of support out there provided through different networks and it's probably um, patchy. Um, in some ways, we're fortunate in that we are a small organisation. You know, we only have um, two business advisors, but they cover the whole of Scotland. But what we measure their effectiveness on is, well, first of all, the feedback from the, the clients, which largely is customer satisfaction. But then what we will go back and do, uh, you know, a year or two years after they've had that support is, is to try and, you know, look at the direct links in terms of what interventions that we made made the biggest difference. So things like obviously when people get that one-to-one -one support, you know, makes a much bigger difference. So it's why we've continually changed the service so that what we're doing is, you know, we're moving towards where we can provide, you know, a much more intense service. Obviously that makes it slightly more um, expensive, you know, to provide because when you think about the staffing time. So we, we balance that up because we, we know at what points people will come into is where they get to and then when we can add in... Um, as I said, you know, a, a more intense service that's going to be more effective. Um, yeah, Brian, I think you're next. Um, maybe I can answer that question a wee bit as well. High says delivers the Just Enterprise programme for the Highlands and Islands, and the Just Enterprise programme is the Scottish Government's programme to enable advice to be there for social enterprises. We measure our success simply by the number of, you know, if we're not getting phone calls, then folk don't like us. If we're getting more phone calls than we got last year, then, you know, forget the research. That means that we're running the corner shop properly and people are coming to us for advice. So we've got loads of inquiries coming in. Um, and the interesting thing, that, again, I'd like you to think about in central Scotland is that north of the, the country, you've got Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which has a social remit. So there are quite a lot of social enterprises that will come on to us asking for specific advice about a particular um, subject. And lo and behold, we can be working along with consultants coming in from Highlands and Islands Enterprise who will be delivering a particular thing. And indeed, we will use Business Gateway who will deliver particular things as well. Um, and when you get that kind of mix, there is actually a lot of support there. But you're right, some of them are rubbish. There are, and, and, some of them are, and some of them are also, some of them are good but you don't get on with them. And, and the whole thing about having that choice of high says or Business Gateway or Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the, the chances are that you'll find somebody there that you'll pick up the phone. I better not say anything else before anybody asks for any names. I, I, I should remember Chick Rooney was a consultant in a previous time. <laughs> anyway, I was a transitional advisor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to pick up, uh, just for Brian, yeah. just to, uh, on Brian's bit, the, the success rate, uh, again, say within Highlands and Islands, and maybe other remote and rural parts of Scotland, not necessarily just the Highlands and Islands, are, are you aware of the success rate in terms of when business start up? Um, success, rate, <laughs> success rates are always too high because people won't give up when they're doing something impossible. Um, you can, you know, <laughs> we go into social enterprises all the time and we look at them and we say, no, you, you know, stop. You know, it's, it's, in, it's insane to try and do this. But you can't, you can't get them to stop because it's a social thing that they're trying to deliver. So they'll be working you know, 10 hours on top of their day job and still trying to make this impossible thing happen. And you've got to love them for it. All right, um, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, I've listened with interest to discussion around the table this morning. Um, I should perhaps say at this point that I'm convener of the volunteering and the voluntary sector cross-party group. And, uh, you know, from the social enterprise point of view, many of the social enterprises rely on volunteers. They don't all have uh, peer employees. Um, so I just wonder where this... Uh, you know, we have this crossover with volunteers and employed staff, and we also have um, 
organisations who are calling themselves social enterprises and others who are saying they're charitable, but actually they are social enterprises. So, but they're all looking for funding as well, from what I can understand. Most of them are looking for funding from the government or, you know, big lottery, different sources. So how does that all get tied together? Because we hear about the minefield, uh, uh, and I hear from social enterprises in my area about how difficult it is to get funding. And yet, um, once they have got funding and they've sort of reached that magic level where they can actually fill in the application forms and they're recognised, they, it is easier for them to get funding in the future, although it's less. But there does come a stage where that dries up because they've had it last year, so they don't get it. So how do, we, how do we look into the future? How do we get that sustainability as well um, so that social enterprises can continue and indeed do what they want to do, which is you know, put, the, put it back into the community and give this social benefit to their communities? Uh, and it, you know, we haven't got a clear definition. Uh, we can't measure the value because it is so uh, difficult. Uh, and it's just where do we go from here? And you, you know, to me, you're, you're saying we give some, some funding to this one and that one, but at the same time, so you must be able to measure that to do that to give that funding. So it's um, it's. Really difficult. I just wonder if anyone's got an answer to um, where we go from here around the, the funding issues and the actual value that we are providing to the communities. Duncan, you were keen to come yeah, in. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, clearly, the, thir the third sector is phenomenally complex, and the interface between the range of bodies in the third sector and the other stakeholders is phenomenally difficult to interrogate. Please remember one thing above all, which is that a social enterprise trades to generate surpluses on a year-on-year -year basis so that it is, it is economically viable and sustainable in the longer term. What that means is partly that whereas to begin with it may wish support and there will be grant funding to start with and the, the, the programme is there. Uh, over time, the aim of a social entrepreneur is to create a self-standing business that does not need to be subsidised. And that is the distinction between it and another form of equally valid and important third sector entity, which may be a charity that perhaps has an endowment or other basis of approach and which, which has an, at its heart a mission, an, an activity, an endeavour that will never be capable of being, uh, the example we had was in relation to um, befriending. You, you, to make it into a business model is actually really seen as, as possibly quite hard in some cases. Now, it becomes a question of recognising and identifying social entrepreneurship and Neil's activities, uh, the activities that the Social Enterprise Academy pursues is to encourage that identification. It becomes important to see how effectively to support the social entrepreneur and to, to enable as many businesses as possible to reduce the attrition rate and the failure rate. Um, and, and then part of it is, 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 is connecting up investment that, that is going to support in the longer term, which raises the question of how you maintain the integrity of the social enterprise if you're going to have an investor coming in, will that weaken or impair the social um, um, the, 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 uh, the, the dedication and, um, towards the mission. But overall, please remember that a sustainable social enterprise should be able to operate without public subsidy, and that is a benefit in relation to the work that needs to be done to maintain the level of social um, and community um, support that we would all wish in Scotland in the future. Sure. Thanks. You? Yes, yeah, just to carry on a similar theme, but not exactly the same. But I think going with uh, social entrepreneurship, there's, there's social responsibility as well. I don't think we can lose that. I think that there's, a, there's a professionalism required. One of the things our organisation is doing is now paying a living wage. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's important. The other thing we're looking at is quality all the time. We're not going to compromise standards. And if you look at kind of an organisation like ours, we are doing things for the long term. We're really in to give services in the long term. So I think to, to have that kind of sustain the long term sustainability. But the downside, if you can do that, you can sometimes make yourself not as, as competitive. It's making sure you get the balance between the quality, you know, 
paying people properly for doing a job as, as professionals, I think vol voluntary work is good, but you have got regulation around disclosures, etc. So I think there's a kind of, there are another range of issues around what we do, but just this social responsibility going along with social entrepreneurship and having social socially driven companies is, is very important. And that can be almost have a kind of negative effect if you're trying to win tenders, but a really positive effect when it comes to customer satisfaction. So there are a few issues in there. Um, Fiona. Volunteers have got a huge role, especially um, with some of the social enterprises in our area um, and the opportunities that volunteering opens for people who would traditionally find difficulty getting into the work space. The issue can come when uh, you almost get to a victim of your own success running a social enterprise and you get to that crossover stage where the manager can't do everything anymore, so they need extra staff, but they're not earning enough money to pay the extra staff. And um, I know that, that we have a social enterprise in West that is at that stage at the moment. In fact, I'm just going to uh, bend Alistair's ear about that afterwards. Um, because uh, in order, if that, if that enterprise is not sustainable, because they're just at that stage where their capacity has grown to the point where they really need to take the next leap, but they don't have the resources to pay another member of the staff. The danger is that the whole thing will collapse, and that particular organisation has something like 40 volunteers attached to it who will just have nowhere to go. So I think that there's a slight gap. Um, and things like the Enterprise Ready Fund and uh, this uh, Enterprise Growth Fund have been really useful in helping uh, organisations make the next step. But some need a wee bit of help before that. Um, and I think that volunteers will always be um, involved in social enterprise, but your, your business shouldn't rely on your volunteers. And th th there's a bit of a danger that in order to get something up and running, you just cram the place with volunteers. And we're talking here about shops. And it's a great, tr there's lots of training, health and safety training, first aid training, everything goes along with it. It's really good, but the shop is dependent on the workforce of volunteers. And I think that's an error. I think you have to use your volunteers for things that um, are added extras, that the volunteer gets something out of that, not just that you're leaning on volunteers to grow your business because you'll come to a critical point where you need extra paid staff and that's a wee bit of a gap in that step up. And I think social investment might be the thing that, that comes in at that point. It has to be said that lots of social enterprise boards are very risk averse. And that's a cultural change that we need to try and promote, is that you will get to a stage in your business where you need to invest. If you, I always say to our members, if you were running your own business, where would you go for the money? Nobody's going to come along and give you a grant if you're running your own business. So what would you do if you get to that critical growth stage? And we've found in Wesley, we've, we've got a very good relationship with Business Gateway, with Scottish business in the community and uh, a, a lot of the intermediary providers. And there's lots of support out there. The Just Enterprise Fund is absolutely brilliant for, for, for uh, people who are at that, that stage of growth. And they maybe just need a skill or um, a bit of advice on one particular aspect that can take them over that hurdle. But I, I have a fear that we'll grow social enterprises to a certain stage. Um, and then if they can't get the right support in at that stage to, to keep them going, that we will in future get a, a worse attrition rate. Okay, I've got um, Brian and Neil who want to come in. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes to go. Uh, when, we've, when we've done that, what I'd like to do is just go around and ask people <coughs> if there was one or two <coughs> things you wanted uh, the committee to take away and try and influence um, subsequent to this meeting, what would that be? So just have a think about that for the next few moments and um, but to continue the discussion, firstly with Brian. My, you were asking about, about funding and so on, and our experience with these 500 social enterprises that we've seen over the last six years is that um, funding isn't really a problem to them. Frequently they know how to get the money. The big problem we see all the time is the capability of boards, not even so much the management, the capability of boards. Um, and it might be kind of interesting to look at that over the next few years. I would love it if there was a law that said you can't be on a board for more than four years. Because what happens is you get 64-year-old guys who are going to be on there for the next 20 years, and they're too embarrassed to say, I can't remember what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> you know, and I have that problem with this committee all the time. 
There's also, let me say the other horrendous thing about why don't we pay boards? Because the really interesting thing that happens, if you don't pay boards, you do get a whole lot of 64-year-old guys. And what you don't get is 30-year-old um, young women because they need to earn. Now, we block out, and if you look at all the boards that we've got in small social enterprises, they're all old folk who don't know, don't know how to make word work. Um, so limit, limit that would be you know, one thing. And uh, limiting the period that it could be on and maybe asking for some kind of qualifications for board members. It is not fair to ask somebody to be a volunteer board member of an organisation that employs 10 people when that volunteer board member doesn't understand what being solvent and not being solvent is and could potentially um, you know, put the employment of, of 10 families um, at risk. And it's not fair. So ask them, either pay them or give them a, ask them to make an investment or require a qualification for them before you give them half a million quid. But isn't that an issue in smaller communities? You know, you're talking about the Highlands and Islands where, you know, in a small village, there may not be Absolutely. that person there. Absolutely. So they might not be there. So that being the case, don't ever dare give them 200,000 quid and expect them to be able to do anything worthwhile with it. Or give them the 200,000 quid and just accept they're not going to do anything with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Neil. Um, to come back to your question, I think Duncan really eloquently described the point of arrival and the kind of where people would like to get to. But the reality is there's a lot of folk on that journey. And, and certainly the Code of Conduct talks about aspiring to a, tra a trading context. <laughs> I, I think it comes back to a function of leadership. You know, organisations are faced with a changing environment in terms of the reduction in grants. And I think we do need to keep investing in leadership development across the whole sector. When we do deliver this, it's ubiquitous in the public sector, it's ubiquitous in the private sector, but we're not seeing that same investment. There, there's some in the, in the uh, Scottish Government's plans, but there's not enough. And I think the, gov the governance question is also a question of leadership. The governance boards need to be well led. And there's far too much focus on competencies about reading a financial paper rather than a reflective discussion on what is your role as a board member in delivering this outcome. And that's a leadership question that's reflective and requires some safe space to talk about, not solely a focus on competence. The competencies have to be there as well, obviously. But the bit we need to add to that is people having an opportunity to look at those questions um, reflectively and safely. Okay, um, we've got just over five minutes left. What I'd like to do is, is just go round our guests and ask them to address the question I put, which is, if you wanted us to take away one or two key issues from today's discussion, things that need to be changed where you think they might be able to influence policy, what would they be? Um, maybe start, Alistair, with yourself and just work our way around. I suppose mine is selfish in relation to uh, the social investment marketplace, but what I would uh, plead with the Scottish Government to be is to be respectful of the fact that there is now a, a diverse and active social investment marketplace, and the Government has a role to play in not compromising the development of that marketplace, but perhaps by supporting the development of it by perhaps supplying less direct investment, but by using its investment as a way to attract new funds into the sector which can come in an appropriate way that doesn't compromise MD's mission or integrity or definitions, but can help to grow further the size of the social economy in Scotland. So funds as a, government funds as a catalyst rather than a and replacement? Funding in an intelligent way, in a, a, in a, in a way that's aware of the, the infrastructure and market that has developed. Okay, Fiona. I would like to see a bigger role for the social enterprise networks. Uh, we're all member-led, we know our members, we know how to get them tapped into the right places. But there's uh, West Lothian is probably the envy of a lot of social enterprise networks in that we are not attached to the local third sector interface. That presents its own problems, but I think that if the money for SENS, if SENS could be more independent, we would get better outcomes in social enterprise. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen? I'd like you all to take a copy of this away because it will save me <laughs> carrying them back to, to Glasgow. But um, I think I would like um, to see the uh, you know, MSPs, Scottish Government, to um, look more closely at the start-up scene. Um, I think uh, you know, there's been a, you know, a, a kind of healthy investment you know, made in that since 2009, but I think there's a lot more that we can do. And I think... 
um, you know, there's some interesting developments, you know, that are going on where you see um, the start-up scene joining up now with what you have normally have seen in quite a linear, you know, process with, say, Social Investment Scotland, and I think there'll be really exciting things, you know, coming out of that, so I think it's like he's just, you know, paying more closer attention to that. Yep. I'll just repeat what I just said. Um, I think there needs to be a, a, a bigger investment and acknowledgement of the role of boards in terms of leadership and leadership development across the third sector. It's a, um, it's a, there's a modest investment going in just now, which is very welcomed, but there needs to be more of it to allow partnership working to happen, to allow um, you know that continuation of moving towards sustainability. And I think it's that area. And that sense of mindset shift, we've got fantastic resources in Scotland. And when we see that coming through in transformational learning, where people see themselves differently, and see themselves, that the role that they have in the board as one of policing themselves rather than being asked to leave, um, I think there's a huge opportunity that we're missing. Andrew. Um, I'm, I'm involved with one of Brian's 64-year-old board members in the development of a, um, a large uh, socialised social enterprise hotel on the Inverness campus. It's a £20 million project. And we've to date received huge amounts of support and encouragement from both HIE and the Scottish Government. Um, and my request would be for that to continue because actually um, the interest and encouragement gives us a credibility and a momentum that we would take a lot longer to generate on our own. Um, Brian. Um, I would like to go back to procurement and suggest that you look very carefully at requiring procurement officers to come out with smaller contracts simple as that. Um, and the other thing is that um, if you're putting large sums of uh, money into organisations, I would like those board members, um, I'd like board members to be qualified in some way and probably limited so that they can't be there for 30 years. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the chance to, uh, for us to speak with you today. I hope you'll take away that social enterprise has huge potential for Scotland and the Scottish economy. I hope you'll appreciate, and, and this is maybe to look at again, that there are stratas, there are different types of social enterprises. We've talked a lot about the public sector facing, the ones that complement the public sector, but there are innovative um, commercial entities that are social enterprises that I could and should be part of the Scottish economy. And please look strategically at that. And for instance, in relation to health and other innovations in the research sector, there are things and, and social challenges that we face in 10, 20, 50 years' time. Social enterprise is part of that solution. But second, I would also say that um, th there's a, an unusually high number of women involved in social enterprises and as social entrepreneurs. And as well as this point about age, not to be ageist, um, the, the, the bringing forward of the potential, the empathies, the, the skills of, 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 of half of Scotland, uh, the, the female um, side of things, is actually something that I think will, will also give huge benefits and is another source of untapped potential to an extent. And Ian. Finally, I, I agree with everybody else <laughs> with all of these things, but I think really there's a couple of things. One on the kind of the, the, the grant funding, the catalyst of the investment. I think having there was a suggestion possibly of a, a three-year kind of investment because things don't happen overnight. You know, there is a kind of a feed-in to allow people to become established and to create markets of their own, and then that, that will lead on. So I think having a kind of you know a, a longer-term grant funding side to make sure there's adequate time. Uh, another thing I'd like the, uh, the government to kind of consider is you know looking at the measurements. A difficult question was how do you measure a return on on that kind of social investment. I think any kind of ways you can measure, appreciate some of the kind of the, 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 out, the it should be outputs based. How can you measure the outputs? I think there may be some thought on, on the outputs so there's not having to sell the outputs so hard every time when it's really difficult sometimes to, 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 to do that. So if you could maybe give some consideration to that point. Okay, thank you. Good. Right, well, with impeccable timing, uh, we have uh, reached the end of our session. So on behalf of the committee members, can I thank you all very much for coming along and contributing to the discussion. Uh, I've certainly found it very useful, and I'm sure the other uh, members have. And we will now consider as a committee how we can take some of these uh, issues forward. Uh, what's going to happen now is the committee is going to move into private session very briefly. Now, I think I heard the rattling of your lunch arriving um, outside. So if you are able to stay uh, on for an informal lunch, we also have some other people uh, who are joining us uh, over lunch. Um, I think we're going to have to ask you to, to vacate and go outside and 
help yourself to lunch. We're going to have a brief discussion and then we'll come out and join you and at which point we can all come back in and have lunch and continue the discussion in a more informal manner. Um, so uh, I'll have a short suspension and we will go into private session. <laughs>